Welcome to this week's Behind the Headlines. Today we're joined by Palo Alto Human Relations Commissioner Jill Onan, and we'll be talking about some of the things that the commission is doing to address LGBTQ needs and gender equality in the community. So welcome, Jill. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, this week we had a story um, about a needs assessment pilot program that the commission is sponsoring. So you can, t can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, definitely. So there is now an Office of LGBTQ Affairs in Santa Clara County. And this is a fairly new office. It was established about three years ago. So obviously Palo Alto is part of Santa Clara County, but we're so far north that sometimes we don't connect well to county resources. So the Palo Alto Human Relations Commission is collaborating with the County Office of LGBTQ Affairs to try to make our local community aware of that office and the services it provides. And also, we wanted to better assess what the needs of the local LGBTQ community are. You know, oftentimes we think everything's fine. We are blessed here in Palo Alto to not have a high rate of hate crimes and so forth. But, you know, sometimes you assume yeah. and you assume a little bit too much. And we really wanted to hear directly from the community on what their experiences are in Palo Alto, what their needs are, and what they think the priority should be in order for the city to better support them. And I think it's particularly important for the city and the county to collaborate today yeah. when there's been some very detrimental changes at the national level in terms of support for LGBTQ people. And in response to that, I think we want to make sure that our local LGBTQ community feels safe, welcome, and included here in Palo Alto. Now, you know, I think um, it's, it's easy to kind of get squishy about needs, but the county did an assessment in, they, they did a survey in 2013, I believe, and they found some pretty surprising disparities, right, between the general population yes. and the LGBTQ population. I mean, there were some, I don't know if you can speak to any of those numbers, but... Yeah, I think the rate of violence in terms of both verbal and physical assault was really shocking. People who are LGBTQ have a much higher rate of being assaulted in all kinds of ways, not only out in public, but by their own families. LGBTQ um, youth are far more likely to be thrown out of their homes at an early age and become homeless while they're still minors. Uh, LGBTQ people are much more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, and therefore substance abuse, alcoholism, and so forth. So it just creates a domino effect that can be very, very negative because uh, people feel very isolated and unwelcome and unloved and uncared for. And so that's just a tragic situation. And even here in the Progressive Bay Area, these things happen all the time. But it had been kind of underneath the radar. So the county's assessment was really focused more on health needs. Uh, our assessment is sort of building off of that. And it's more in terms of experiential uh, occurrences. When you live here, work here, visit here, because our survey is open to anyone, basically, not just people who reside in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. but anyone of any age who wants to comment on the treatment of LGBTQ people here. Uh, well, now, do you, when you go to a restaurant here, do you feel disrespected because you're a same-sex couple? When you go to the doctor here, do you feel like your doctor asks inappropriate questions or doesn't ask appropriate questions because you're an LGBTQ person? When you're in school here as an LGBTQ youth, do you feel safe or do you feel bullied? So those we're trying to kind of get at the, that type of experience here in Palo Alto. So our survey is a little bit different from what the county was trying to assess. But I think it's complementary, and the data will be shared, and I think a lot of learning will come out of that. So you've had two of these forums so far, right? There was one in Mountain View and the one in Palo Alto? Yes. So what were some of the um, issues that came up, and, and were, the issues, were there some different issues in Palo Alto than Mountain View, or did they sort of mirror one another? There was some overlap, because our communities are somewhat similar. Um, the Palo Alto event, I think, brought out some more what I would call cultural issues for the mm -hmm. LGBT community. I think in the Mountain View Forum, there was more of a focus on safety. Um, and it was held on a Saturday morning, and so it attracted sort of a different demographic. Our, we did our event in the evening in the hopes of capturing people after school, after work. Was so this forth. an invite? Only event or just whoever wanted to come we, in to participate? Yeah, we sent out an, an okay. event, right, just so we could kind of target how much food okay. to serve because mm -hmm. we were kind of serving a dinner 
on some snacks with ours. But people were many people walked in and were totally okay. welcome. Um, but we were trying to attract more of a cross section. Mm-hmm. And I think what we learned is that culturally, the LGBT community just doesn't have dedicated spaces to meet, to socialize, to sort of be with their their people. And as I thought about it, I realized I had, like many, I think, well-meaning, open-minded liberal people, just assumed that LGBTQ folks just sort of blend in and everything's fine. Well, in reality, LGBTQ uh, cultural identity, I think, is more aligned to, say, what a Jewish community might experience or the senior community. Sometimes you want uh, a dedicated space for your people, your tribe, if if you will. Mm -hmm. And... And, of course, you want to be part of the mainstream fabric, but you also want a time and a place where you can just be with other, other LGBTQ people. And we just don't have anything like that here in the Mid-Peninsula. It's really very uh, culturally uh, desert-like. People have to go either up to San Francisco or down to San Jose to experience anything like an LGBTQ community center. I think another thing we learned is that over the years, LGBTQ people have been targeted politically, socially, economically, so some of those battles are not what our community is interested in right now because they, here in Palo Alto, are not facing those sorts of discrimination as much as in the past. Um, and also the AIDS crisis is now, I mean, that's a better managed health issue. Mm-hmm. There are treatments available. Many people have access to health care, thank, thank God. I mean, we've made a huge progress since the 80s. But what people say now is, but I still, I don't have a place to meet other LGBTQ parents I don't have a place to just go have coffee with other LGBTQ people. There's not like a, a friendly pub or bar where I can just hang out. I mean, and so some of those battles from the past have so shaped what we thought the resources should be that now we've sort of overlooked that. The community's changed, evolved, matured, and, and where do they go? And youth, too. I mean, I think they really need some safe spaces. And there's some, but there's nothing dedicated. I was, so I was surprised in the article um, because seniors... Um, it seemed like they had um, a lot of needs that weren't being addressed. Were you surprised by that? I was surprised um, because, again, I, I guess I think of Palo Alto as being such a progressive community. And I think senior LGBTQ people really are bearing the burden. They often came of age in a time where it was not okay to be LGBTQ and spent a portion of their lives closeted and or fighting tooth and nail for the right to be with the person that they loved. Now as a senior, they're facing, I think, a whole new set of challenges. They may have lost their partner, but the way we offer senior support services is really geared toward heterosexual couples. There isn't always a sensitivity or a training around what a senior LGBTQ widow or widower might need. I think it just creates a double sense of isolation. Seniors are already facing that, and if you're LGBTQ senior, it's, it's even more so. I think there's just some real sensitivity and some training that could be useful I think for cities and for agencies that work with seniors. I thought it was really interesting because, I, you know, as you know, I attended the forum, and one of the things that really struck me were people were talking about even going to a mortuary. You know, services were just not geared for them, or they were just ignored, or, you know, not taken into the... We still don't realize that there's, you know, you have married couples... Which, who have certain rights, and then it's the, you know, the people who have a partner, and they're, they're left behind. And I was really surprised, too. You know, I think it was kind of interesting when they were talking about um, the need for having role models for youth mm-hmm. and the sort of the juxtaposition between you know, using seniors, getting down their histories, that type of thing, and making seniors and prominent LGBTQ people apparent in in the mm-hmm. society, where, whether it's having, uh, uh, you know, things that the city could do, like maybe having a statue or, or something like that. Could you speak to any of those things at all? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I What I felt from the youth that I talked with is that um, although they feel, often feel accepted or at least tolerated in the community, um, LGBTQ people and their lifestyle is not what I would call normalized. So it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell situation in, in many professional areas. So the student I talked to, for example, mentioned, you know, teachers at my school would casually mention my husband, my wife, if they were a heterosexual person. But if it was an LGBTQ teacher, that person simply never addresses his or her personal life. 
It's just sort of off the table because it's still felt to be too sensitive, too controversial to mention. So as an LGBTQ youth, you grow up with this idea that, well, that group of people can talk about personal issues and mention family, but if you're LGBTQ, you just hush up about it. So you're not discriminated against in an active way. You have a job and you're, and you're paid at the right, same pay rate, but you just know intuitively that you're not supposed to go there. And I think that just creates a sense of fear and isolation. So it, it would be super cool to have you know, a gay, lesbian, transgender teacher be able to say, oh, I, you know, my same sex husband or wife and I did this, you know, as casually as a heterosexual teacher might, might mention that. So I, as a result of this sort of still somewhat closeted behavior, which is, I think, you know, foisted upon LGBTQ professionals, kids are not seeing it as it's perfectly normal to have a teacher or to have a counselor or a doctor or a minister There's no rabbi. Models. There's yeah. no role models. So that's a cultural shift. And I think, again, with some training, at least in the public arena, we could maybe address that. Now, one of the subjects that came up also was um, that Palo Alto has, in the school district, there's, there's been, you know, as you know, the uh, city has basically given a lot of money, more than $10,000, to um, support Outlet, mm -hmm. which is a program for, they offer services to LGBTQ kids in the schools. But um, there's a whole part that has to do with, basically, with churches and, and the faith community, and at least the table I was sitting at said it's really still pretty uneven. Mm -hmm. That in some cases, some of the some of the uh, faith institutions in the city uh, they're very supportive, but it takes more than just sending out just putting up a, a rainbow flag, and that there's still a lot of safety issues mm -hmm. related between religion and and LGBTQ people. Yeah, I agree so. with that. I don't know if you, did you have any sense of that also? Did you have, yes, did you feel um, anybody saying It is that? very uneven. There are churches that have made a lot of outreach to LGBTQ people and made sure that they understand that they'd be very welcome and included in their services. But some churches come from a more traditional, um, more old-fashioned kind of background and have been slow to accept or are not accepting. And some of them are very upfront and frank about the fact that we consider this a sin and, and then some of them fudge it by saying, well, we support the sinner, but not the sin. So you can come and be part of our community as long as you never engage in any, you know, homosexual type behavior, which is kind of like, you know, a, a very strange deal with the devil to, to sort of make with an LGBTQ person. And, you know, and I come from a Catholic background, and I mean, the Catholic Church still considers homosexuality a sin. And, you know, of course, there, there have been some strides forward, but... It's, a lot of it is around, well, you can't live your truth if you want to be part of this community. If you want to live your truth, how do you get accepted? But, you know, churches are, in a sense, a private organization. And, again, the city, you know, can only do so much outreach there. And, and we can't, like, change the doctrines of the Catholic Church and they kind of force that to happen. Those are, again, shifts that have to sometimes happen from within. What we can do as a city, I think, is support people in public spaces and in public institutions like our schools and to, to try to normalize things to the point that the rest of the community has to catch up to that and kind of get some momentum around that. So, so that's what I want to ask you. So I know um, the goal is to have these forums throughout different cities in the Bay mm -hmm. Area. Then once you gather all this information, then what do you do with the information? What's the next step? Because I, I thought I had read that um, Part of the survey, people had said they wanted more um, training, specialty training for like uh, mm -hmm. emergency response teams or um, mm -hmm. police. So um, what would be the next step? Well, we are going to have our survey up on the city's web pages mm -hmm. for the next, I think, two months. It should come down sometime in June. Then we're going to have to compile all the survey results, both from the listening forum and from survey respondents, and coordinate with the county to kind of sift through and come up with what we think the top priority should be. And then we have to figure out, as a Human Relations Commission, how we want to communicate that information to our city leaders, because ultimately they'll have to make that mm -hmm. call. And I, I think that the next steps will be coming along later in the year once we do have all that information. Okay, that's great. And then, um, how do you, I don't know whether or not you have the uh, URL memorized for that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I know that it's been posted since the Friday after the event on the city web pages. 
Um, hopefully it's easy to find. I think they yeah. were going to either post it on the Office of Human Services or on the HRC page. Okay, that's good. And so kind of segueing a little bit into um, just there's whole, been a whole thing about gender equality mm -hmm. also. Can you talk a little bit about some of, some of the um, programs that you're looking at in terms of that? Yes, yeah, so gender equity has you know, become a, a very hot watchword of the moment. And Palo Alto, again, is a progressive city. Back in, um, I think it was 2002, the city passed a resolution around CEDAW. And CEDAW is a framework for ensuring gender equity. Uh, it's been adopted internationally, and it came out of the UN's resolution for equal rights. And unfortunately, the US is one of the only industrialized nations to have not adopted it because we failed to pass the Equal Rights Amendment back mm -hmm. in the 70s. So the CEDAW gives city by city a chance to, uh, to create gender equity locally with the hope that someday we will have a national movement to pass something like the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, we're very supportive of that, but in order to pass um, a CEDAW type resolution, or not a resolution, but a CEDAW type, type statute, certain infrastructure changes have to be made within the city and a needs assessment has to be done and so forth. So Palo Alto is a little bit on the small side to be able to do that, but our commission did recommend to city council that we take a look at adopting the CEDAW type framework for the city to ensure gender, gender equity here. And if CEDAW turns out to not be the right framework, I think we should explore some other options. Because I think there are other ways to also do it. Although being part of CEDAW would tie us to an international movement around gender equity, which would be so cool for Palo Alto to take part in. Could you give me just the kind of an idea of a couple of things that are in CEDAW that you think might be able to be, be, be used in Palo Alto? Well, CEDAW, one, we have to assess where gender inequity occurs. And I think there are some issues around pay here that would be worth taking a look at within the city. Because again, sometimes discrimination is not in an active or even conscious way, but it's just institutionalized in the way that women get tracked into certain jobs or get discriminated against sort of passively or inadvertently because they say have taken time off to have children and then sort of get punished for it in the workplace. And so sometimes when you take a, a sharper look at things, you realize, oh, this results in a mommy track where women are consistently underpaid. So I think there were things like that that would be good to take a look at, and CEDAW would give us a framework for doing that. How about gender-neutral bathrooms? So Another thing that's come up. <laughs> gender-neutral bathrooms have come up in many contexts. Um, I'm a supporter of that. I think that, especially for the transgender community, that is such a big deal in schools and in public buildings to, to feel like you have to be afraid about which choice you make and to constantly worry about being assaulted if you're in the wrong bathroom. Um, I think many of us live in multi-gender homes. I mean, I grew up sharing a bathroom with my dad. You know, many people have, you know, people of the opposite sex living with them as family members. And so I don't think it's so weird to share bathrooms with people of the other sex. So I, I'm hoping the city will really take that into account. I know at the Y, where I'm a, a longtime member, now has gender-neutral bathrooms. And the Pete's, where I love to hang out, has now has gender-neutral bathrooms. So I'm seeing changes, and I hope to just see more of that. I think it's important for, for people to feel comfortable and not just tolerated, but really welcome and their needs being taken into account. So moving forward, what, what do you think the, the commission will do at this point? In terms of in terms of uh, gender equality, will there be recommendations that you're going to make, or are there going to be more forms? What kinds of ac activities do you think you'll be taking? Well, we did pass a resolution around CEDAW, and we forwarded that to City Council. So at this point, sort of the ball is in City Council's court. They'll have to take a look at what we recommended and see if the CEDAW framework will fit the city. And if it does, then it may come back to the HRC for help with. Creating, we would have to create some sort of, uh, I think like a commission as part of the CEDAW framework on gender equity. So that would, I think, be a standing commission. There would be some new infrastructure that would have to be added. So we may have a voice to play there. And if CEDAW is not the right framework, then it's conceivable that the city council would come back to us and say, well, we really want to move forward on gender equity. This framework doesn't fit well. Is there something else that we could do? Because I think there are some alternatives that we have yet to explore. So the HRC, I would imagine, would be active in that as well. Do you have any ideas about what some of those alternatives might be? There are some alternatives that other cities have used. So we may not do 
things on as big a scale as CEDAR requires to get that certification. Or we can maybe do something in the, in the short term to, to get us closer to gender equity and then look at CEDAR as an aspiration that will work toward over the years. Because as I said, some infrastructure would have to be put in place and that may take Palo Alto a while to, to figure out. Um, and there's other cities around the world that have done things that we might model after, but we have to do a little bit more research and understand. The city that's closest to us in many ways is Berkeley, but Berkeley is twice as big as Palo Alto. So again, it kind of comes down to scale. Um, do we have the scale to, to implement this kind of change? And since Berkeley did, Berkeley had, an, had enough uh, in-place infrastructure to make the transition fairly smoothly. For Palo Alto, it would be more from the ground up. So it would be a little bit harder to do. So, but it doesn't mean it's impossible, but we, we would have to really consider that, consider the time, the energy, and the resources it would take. And so maybe another path would work better for us in the short term, and CDOT could be something that we would progress toward over some time. I, I don't want to speak for city council because it's really in their court, but just in looking at what cities around the world have done, that's kind of my sense, is that we may be a little bit on the small side. And so we may have to be a little bit more creative in how we do it. But we will do it our Palo Alto way because we're all committed to that. Right. Is there anything we, anything we didn't touch upon that you wanted to talk about? Um, I think what we learned is, um, or what I, I feel like the commission has been learning, is that we, in general, have a really great community here. I would say it's accepting and tolerant of, of many lifestyles and types of people. But in terms of true inclusion and diversity, I think we have a ways to go. To feel truly included and to have a truly diverse community, you know, things need to be accessible to people. And people need to feel like they can go and hang out and just be who they truly are and not have to work around challenges. And I think many people in Palo Alto are still working around things, getting to yeah. you know, a pretty comfortable lifestyle, but it takes some work to, to do that. And I think the city could really focus more on true inclusion, which would mean that people can genuinely be their authentic selves here and not have to work around which bathroom to use or how to get upstairs when the elevator's not working or avoiding, having to not avoid going places where they know there isn't going to be mm -hmm. sufficient parking if they're disabled and so forth. So that requires sensitivity and more, I think, some more awareness and training. And I think that's something I know I, as a commissioner, will really want to bring forward. It's these subtleties, these nuances that really need to kind of get dredged up sometimes and looked at a little more closely. And we cannot assume, especially today, that everything's fine and stay in kind of a bubble uh, here in Palo Alto because there are things happening all around us that affect this community. And so I think we just need to be really aware. And well, that's, that's the last, one last thing I wanted to bring up as well is this, this has been a pretty proactive HRC, and um, and it's and also you're working on pretty much from a mandate from the council to develop ways or or recommend ways that the city can be more inclusive, not just to LGBTQ, but mm -hmm. to all people. We have larger immigrant population, mm -hmm. a lot of changing demographics, and so if, maybe if you could just touch briefly on some of the other ave avenues and areas that you're you've been exploring as well. Oh, well, definitely. So. Um, earlier, um, this was I think right after the national election in 2016, we did a program called Immigrants and Allies. We were very concerned about the fear that was inculcated here in Palo Alto among the immigrant community. So we've never been a community that focused on who was documented and who wasn't documented. And we wanted to reassure the immigrants who live here that we're, that we're going to continue to not focus on documentation status. We don't want people to be afraid to call the police if they need help. We don't want people to fail to get health care when they need help because they're so afraid of their immigration status. So I think that was a way to reaffirm Palo Alto's values along those lines. Um, we're continuing to work with the Welcome America program to try to help immigrant families understand, you know, what it means to be part of Palo Alto and how to kind of adapt to the culture here when they move here. So those are kind of outreach things that we're doing. Of course, as we've been discussing, we're doing outreach now to the LGBTQ community that's been ensconced here for a long time and in some ways comfortable here, but trying to make it feel better supported and to make the city more aware. Uh, I mentioned before we, be, we began taping the conversation, I think also disabled and senior people have had some of their needs not fully understood or acted upon, and I think that there's a place for reaching out to those people to make sure that they feel safe and included. Mm -hmm. um, seniors, for example, often can't access city amenities or have trouble you know, utilizing our 32 parks. So I think we need to start to make sure that everyone who lives here really can take part in the city as much as they want to and not really be uh, locked out because of 
infrastructure problems, uh, lack of parking, lack of transportation, which is a big issue for seniors. And, um, and the city can, can try to do its part to open up all those avenues. Well, Jill, thanks for, for being here. Um, I think that wraps it up for this week's Behind the Headlines. If you liked what you heard, press subscribe below. If you want to keep updated on Palo Alto News, go to paloaltoonline.com yeah. or follow us on social media. Um, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.